Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist. Welcome to another COVID debunking video. And boy, do I have a stinker for you this week. This is going to be a longer episode than usual, so let's just rip this mandate off. I'm going to be covering an episode of The Dr. Drew Show. Let's get into it. And parts of the show may be examining differing points of view uh, and important, important issues. And uh, today will be no different. We are specifically talking to Robert Kennedy. He has a new documentary out called The Real Anthony Fauci. And there's that massive stinker I said I had for you. His guest is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Oh my God. I do hope that Dr. Drew challenges him and tells him exactly why he's wrong in practically everything that he says. Let's see if that will happen, or if Dr. Drew will go full anti-science. In case you didn't know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a prolific anti-vaxxer who has been spreading disinformation about vaccines and vaccine safety for years now. More recently, he wrote a book called The Real Anthony Fauci, which I read and reviewed here on this channel in a multi-part series, and it left me feeling like I'd rather eat a raw chicken sandwich from Arby's than ever listen to anything Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has to say again. It was just that stupid. But like the sadistic masochist that I am, I couldn't help but torture my ears just a little bit more after learning that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. had appeared on Dr. Drew's show. My one hope here was that even though I had to listen to Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s garbage claims, I was hoping that Dr. Drew would challenge them. Not an unreasonable hope, but let's see how that hope worked out for me. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to start this conversation by rambling on about how big pharma is being funded by regulatory agencies. If you've been familiar with this channel before, then you know that I've covered this. This is extremely misleading. Recently, Dr. Susan Oliver made a great YouTube video explaining just exactly why this reasoning is so stupid. Her analogy was this. You go to take a driver's license exam. You pay to take that driver's license exam. That payment is not a guarantee that you are going to pass said exam. Indeed, many people fail their driver's license exams, even though they're funding the industry that issues their right to drive a car. It's the same thing for pharmaceutical industries. It is the law that they pay fees to the government regulatory agencies that are supposed to review and pass judgment on their applications. This payment is not a guarantee that their applications are going to pass, and indeed, the vast majority of pharmaceutical drug applications fail review. This is not what you would expect if pharmaceutical industries were bribing or otherwise in bed with regulatory agencies in any way, such as RFK Jr. claims. In fact, pharmaceutical industries hate the fact that they have to pay these fees to regulatory bodies in order to have their applications reviewed. If they had it their way, then they would much rather prefer Congress to cover all of these costs so that the pharmaceutical industries could keep more money in their pockets and not pay exorbitant fees for applications that are likely to fail on projects that already have a huge price tag on them. That's the reality in the vast majority of cases. There is no evidence of corruption in this structure. It's just one of the many pieces of nonsense that RFK Jr. spews in practically every interview that he gives. So let's play that clip and then see what Dr. Drew actually had to say about it. I do hope he challenged it. But here's one of the problems, is that our regulatory agencies are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. So FDA gets almost 50% of its total budget from pharmaceutical companies. It gets 75% of its drug regulatory drug approval budget from pharmaceutical companies. So they're not working for you and me. They're working for those companies. So that's what RFK Jr. said. Now let's see what Dr. Drew's response is. You better challenge it, buddy. Don't disappoint me. Commercial um, features of that relationship are now wag the, the tail that wags the regulatory dog. Let me, um, before we bring Dr. Kelly in here, I have a couple, two last things, which is, um, let's go back to the movie. Yeah, he has no comment. He just lets RFK Jr. spew that nonsense on his show and then moves on to talking about the movie based on the terrible Anthony Fauci book that RFK Jr. wrote. Uh, procedural biases that uh, Dr. Fauci instituted during AIDS. Biases is not the quite right word. Th things like silencing dissenters. Silencing dissenters during the beginning of the AIDS pandemic? You mean people who denied that HIV caused AIDS denied that antiviral medications worked against it, and people who 
spread fear and nonsense about the virus, saying that it could only infect gay or black people? Those dissenters, really? I'd love to know what the alternative to silencing them here is. Do you want to take action on their claims? Do you think that they're valuable claims? Evidence-based? Come on, Dr. Drew. You should be above this. Boy, those kinds of fear uh, excesses certainly uh, very familiar given what he did during COVID. Again, do you mean people who claimed that certain medications that have no evidence of efficacy work against COVID? You mean the people who just wanted COVID to rip across the population and us not do anything about it? Or the people who just said that we should protect the vulnerable, however they expect to do that without public health measures? Or people who deny that vaccines work? I mean, really, who are we talking about here? And who does Dr. Drew think actually deserves a voice that Fauci silenced during the pandemic? This is just starting out really silly. But then they move into a topic that really infuriated me when I was reading that Anthony Fauci book. It's the topic of AZT, an antiretroviral that is really important in treating HIV infection. This is a drug that is used in modern antiretroviral cocktails to prevent the progression of HIV infection to AIDS. It also helps prevent people from spreading the virus by keeping the virus at undetectable levels. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. thinks that this medication is poison. It's a garbage belief, and I covered it way in depth in my review of that Anthony Fauci book. Go check that out if you want more details. But let's see if Dr. Drew actually challenges him on this. Yeah. That was the problem. Uh, this is where you and I are, are going to disagree. This is where you and I disagree because because I, I you, you this is exactly this is the only this is a place where you and I are going to disagree, which is I was there. I was involved in the research. I was there when we opened the boxes of AZT, and you cannot imagine how thrilling it was when we were telling people every day they had six months to live, and we were never wrong. And now we had at least something. We could do something. Yes, we had to watch their CBC. Yes, there was bone marrow suppression, but we could do something. And alongside of that, we developed treatments for cryptosporidium and isospora and pneumocystis and the Burkitt's lymphoma that were tearing them in half. We developed all these things as we pushed it back over a couple of years and other antivirals came in. Oh, Dr. Drew is actually challenging RFK Jr. here. This makes my soul happy. <gasps> This gives me hope for the rest of the episode that maybe Dr. Drew is going to challenge RFK Jr.'s garbage beliefs. He's absolutely right here. AZT was a game changer in the treatment of HIV. People who were HIV positive and had progressed to AIDS were in terrible shape. They were just dying horrible deaths and there was absolutely nothing that doctors could do to help them. AZT came along and actually improved their condition. It helped combat the HIV virus such that their immune systems could recover enough to fight off the deadly infections that eventually killed them. And he's right that AZT was not perfect, which is why in modern antiretroviral cocktails used to treat HIV infections, AZT is not the only antiretroviral. The reason being, if it were the only one there, then HIV would eventually develop resistance to it and it would become ineffective against the virus. But by combining lots of different antiretrovirals that are going to target multiple different parts of the virus at the same time, it makes the barrier for the virus to pass in order to overcome all those challenges much, much higher, practically impossible. This is because a virus mutating one target is relatively easy, but mutating several different targets all at the same time is really, really difficult. But Robert is unfazed by this challenge, and he seeks to just paint AZT as a dangerous poison. And that's exactly what he does after Dr. Drew responds to him. So let's see how Dr. Drew handles that. Please don't disappoint me, Dr. Drew. Keep this happiness on my face and just challenge the garbage. This person died of AIDS or this person may have died from toxicity from the AZT. But you don't know that unless you have a study that really allows you to look at that. And that Which was is... Very, very much uh, pertinent to the present moment. Uh, for instance, we're using things like 
Paxlovid under the age of 65, and we have zero studies for that, where you have vaccine therapies for five-year-olds. We have zero RCT on this. We have mask wearing in schools, zero RCTs on this. After that seemingly impassioned challenge to RFK Jr. and his garbage about AZT, Dr. Drew just moves on and himself makes garbage stupid claims. We absolutely do have randomized controlled trials of COVID vaccines in children under the age of five. We absolutely do have randomized controlled trials of mask wearing in communities. We absolutely do have evidence that Paxlovid is a highly effective antiviral drug against SARS-CoV-2. You can find research to all of that linked in the description below. I've discussed these topics before on my channel, so for now we're just going to move on and continue with this dumpster fire of a Dr. Drew episode. The most commonly used vaccine in the world is the DTP vaccine, the diphtheria tetanus process. WHO gives it to 161 million African children a year, and, and it is the benchmark vaccine. I'm going to stop him right here because you don't need to listen to his rant. But what he goes on to claim is that DTP vaccines are responsible for an increase in all-cause mortality in African children. These claims are completely baseless and not repeatable. He references the work of Peter Abbey and colleagues who basically claim to show just that. They claim to show that DTP vaccines increase the risk of all-cause mortality in children in developing nations. However, these studies are small, and most importantly, they're not replicated in other populations that are studied by other groups. Just think this through scientifically. If this were true, then you would expect to see that effect replicated across multiple different populations, because African children are not the only ones who get DTP vaccines. They are administered globally. You would expect to see it in other developing nations. You would expect to see this phenomenon. But we don't. We consistently don't. It's only this one group of anti-vaxxers who consistently try to push it as a real message. But it's just not holding up to the science. But of course, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here is doing what anti-vaxxers do. He is cherry-picking data from the literature. He is picking only papers that support his claim while ignoring the vast majority of literature which completely disagrees with him. It's classic anti-vaxxer tactics. That's why you need long-term placebo-controlled studies with vaccines. And we have that. Every new vaccine that enters the market, including all of the old ones when they first came on the market, were all tested in randomized controlled clinical trials. These vaccines are also monitored post-market indefinitely. They are constantly monitored for safety in any population that they are rolled out to. We have decades and decades of scientific research going into the vaccines that are classically put on the childhood vaccine schedule. They are overwhelmingly determined to be safe and very effective. These findings have been confirmed and replicated countless times by several different research groups spanning several different countries and several different institutions and universities. That is what the science of vaccines tells us, that they are extremely safe and extremely effective. RFK Jr. is denying that science, and Dr. Drew having him on his show and not challenging this blatant denial of established science is complicit in spreading this kind of disinformation. In the description, along with several other resources, I am posting an extensive review of vaccine safety by the Institute of Medicine, which is an independent group of experts that regularly publish books on their findings reviewing vaccine safety literature. I highly recommend this resource if you are interested in this topic. Uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, here's what we know from Pfizer's data. There were 22,000 people in the vaccine group and 22,000 people in the placebo group. Dr. Drew, Dr. Fauci did something that should make you mad. He said we were gonna to to get a five-year study, but after two months, they unblinded it. Why did they do that? That's a question you should be asking Dr. Fauci. No, Robert, you don't have to ask Dr. Fauci. You just have to read the protocol of the study. It was predetermined in the protocol that patients would be unblinded after a certain amount of time. In other words, after the study was completed and had gathered all of the necessary data needed to submit an emergency use authorization, then the patients would be unblinded and offered the vaccine if they were in the placebo group. 
This absolutely does not reduce the quality of safety data. When it comes to vaccine safety, when we talk long term, we mean really about six to eight weeks. That's because no non-live vaccine can possibly have any negative health effects on you past that time frame. The reason being because those negative health effects are going to either come from the vaccine ingredients if you're allergic to them or from your immune response to those ingredients. It's your immune response that can make you feel sick and cause adverse effects. However, once these immune responses are completed and you're left with immune memory, you can't be affected negatively by the vaccines anymore. There's just no conceivable way for it to happen. That's why, again, long term for vaccines is about six to eight weeks. But just having that time frame is not what makes us most confident in vaccine safety. No, in fact, it has way more to do with the number of doses given than it ever had to do with the time frame that we follow a group of individuals post-vaccination. As Dr. Paul Offit says, he never breathes a sigh of relief until the first million doses of a new vaccine are given. Now again, let's use our science brains and think about why this might be. We already know that non-live vaccines can't possibly affect you negatively months and months after the dose is given. So why do we want to see a first few million doses of the vaccine given in order to be confident that it's safe? It's because serious adverse events from vaccines are exceedingly rare, and it is entirely possible that you're not going to see a real serious adverse event in a population of about 20,000 people in a randomized controlled trial. It's just statistically not likely that you're going to see an adverse event that rare in a group that relatively small. But it's not practical to do a randomized controlled trial with over a million people. It just is not going to work feasibly. That's why monitoring vaccines for safety after they are rolled out is so critically important, and that's why it's done. When it comes to COVID vaccines, we've had billions of doses given all over the world, and we have almost two years of safety data comparing those who have been vaccinated to those who have not been vaccinated, or comparing them to just a background rate of serious adverse events that normally occur within a population without vaccines. These kinds of studies are constantly being done all over the world, and they keep finding the same thing, that COVID vaccines are safe. But Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants to lie to you. He wants to convince you that there is a boogeyman called Big Pharma that needs to be taken down for everything they do, including life-saving vaccines. And that's just wrong. And it's wrong for Dr. Drew to have him on his show and view him so favorably. So now you go to table five, which is the all-cause mortality data. And what they showed is in the vaccine group, 21 of the 22,000 people died over the six-month period from all causes. In the placebo group, only 17 died. So what that would indicate is that... Statistical insignificance. That's what it indicates, Robert. You're not going to get a significant number of people dying of COVID-19 or any cause within that time period and with that small of a population. It's just not going to happen. That's why the randomized controlled trial for COVID vaccines were not designed to measure differences in all-cause mortality. That wasn't one of their goals. You'd know that if you read the paper. For once. Ever. We are seeing excess mortality in 2010-22 that is 40% greater than 2021. Oh my god. I have seen this claim so much on social media lately. I think it's useful to address here. Here's a graph of raw excess mortality for the United States, ranging from years 2022 all the way back to 2015. The largest peaks in excess deaths were 2020, 2021, and the beginning of 2022 with the Omicron variant just gaining ground. The vast majority of this large number of deaths were in the unvaccinated. These data are consistent with the fact that COVID vaccines reduce risk of severe outcomes, including death, from COVID something that RFK Jr. denies. But people like Robert who are making these kinds of claims about excess deaths are typically referring to European countries. So let's look at the UK, for example. If we look at raw excess mortality, we can see that the worst times of excess death for the UK were in 2020 and 2021. 
The UK is a country that dropped heavy COVID restrictions once its population was sufficiently vaccinated against COVID-19. This dropping of prevention measures helped Omicron bring case numbers to all-time highs in the UK. However, despite this, the overall number of deaths from COVID were remaining consistently at all-time lows relative to other major peaks in cases. So what we are seeing in this graph is that in 2022, with practically no prevention measures and lots of COVID cases, we are seeing excess deaths slightly above previous times in the pandemic when cases were very low thanks to measures that everybody loves like lockdowns and mask mandates. However, these levels of excess deaths are not rising above what we would expect from a typical flu season and are coming nowhere near the major peaks of excess deaths that we saw during the height of the COVID pandemic. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is now pretending to care about excess death rates, but he's spinning it in order to lie to you and make you afraid of COVID vaccines. It is despicable. And Dr. Drew, again, is complicit because does he challenge this? No. No, he doesn't. Thank you, sir. We're going to bring Dr. Kelly Victory in here. We're going to take a little break and pay, pay some bills. The book and the movie is The Real Anthony Fauci. I suggest you check all of it out. Uh, uh, Caleb, I wonder if you can put, uh, yes, all the books up there, in fact. Yep, Dr. Drew even goes as far as openly endorsing Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s god-awful book. And again, I reviewed the whole book on my channel in a multi-part series. Go check that out if you want to see just how bad the book is and just how bad of a product Dr. Drew is promoting here. It's shameful. Next in this episode, Dr. Kelly Victory comes on and talks to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for a while, and she's even worse than Dr. Drew. So let's see how that went. You know, we knew from the very beginning that we weren't all at equal risk from this thing. Just to be clear, she's talking about COVID-19 here, and yeah, that's not news, Kelly. We know that not everyone is at equal risk of SARS-CoV-2. But guess what? In order to protect the people who are at risk, which were millions of people, we have to work together to create public health solutions that kind of everybody has to be a part of. So not sure what your point is. We knew that masks do nothing to stop the spread of respiratory viruses. We knew that social distancing was a totally made up construct. Gee, Kelly, if you had a patient spewing Ebola out of their orifices in your office, would you want to be right up close to them or very far away? If you had to be up close to them, would you want to have protective equipment on? Yeah, I think you would. We knew that readily available cheap medications like IVM and HCQ um, were very, very successful. Nope. Ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine have failed to show efficacy in every randomized controlled trial they have been used in. And given that this cast of people seems to like randomized controlled trials, you think they'd respect those results, but nope, just more fancy and denial. I reported from the very beginning that the vaccines would be an abject failure and likely cause significant harm to people and, and on and on. COVID vaccines have saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. And no matter what you believe about the severity of the virus, that matters. And to deny that makes you a terrible person. Sorry. The three leading causes of death in this country are number one, uh, cancer, um, number two, heart attacks, and the third cause of death is uh, is misuse of pharmaceutical drugs. Another classic banger from RFK Jr. here. He says this all the time, and it's just plain wrong. He even gets it more wrong than normal here. Number one in 2020 was heart disease. Normally, it's heart disease. Number two is normally cancer. And for 2020, number three, ironically, it was COVID, not misuse of pharmaceuticals. This is an old claim that came from a publication that spawned terrible headlines from terrible science journalists. It's a study that claims to look at deaths from medical malpractice, but they fail to even causally link the deaths to the harm caused by the medical malpractice that they looked at. Ultimately, this led the researchers to a number that the scientific community considers at best an exaggeration that was produced by combining a small number of studies not representative of the entire U.S. population and weren't designed, again, to actually causally link the deaths to medical errors. 
the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or Policies is set to meet to decide to opine on whether or not to add these COVID vaccines to the childhood vaccination schedule. And for people who are watching, the reason that's critically important is because if those vaccines are added to the childhood immunization uh, program or schedule, they will enjoy blanket immunity. Moderna, Pfizer will have blanket immunity from any liability because of the National Vaccine Injury Protection Program. There's so much wrong with that, it's hard to know where to start. First of all, adding COVID vaccines to the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program is something that would be really good because while adverse events from vaccines are exceedingly rare, they do happen. And for those people who do experience serious adverse events from vaccines, they deserve compensation from the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. If you're unaware of the history of this program, I'll link an article in the description, and I've talked about it before on this channel, but go check out that article for a quick read. Second of all, this is not blanket immunity. These companies are still going to face consequences if they do things like intentionally hide evidence or commit fraud or commit negligence. These companies are not immune to these things, and they would face really serious consequences for doing these things. We've already seen certain consequences come upon the J&J &J vaccine when it was found that it had a one in a million chance of producing a very rare blood clot disorder, particularly in women. While that particular case with the J&J &J and AstraZeneca vaccines were not cases of fraud or negligence or anything like that, it does show that these safety surveillance systems are working. It does show that you would catch these things. And if those surveillance systems were to catch something that did happen to be fraud, negligence, or anything like that, then those companies would face serious consequences. They are not legally immune and anybody who tells you different is lying to you. And in fact, Kelly knows that she's lying to you here because later in the interview, RFK Jr. practically confirms what I'm telling you now by saying that yes, you can still sue these companies through a federal system if they do commit fraud, negligence, what have you. And we know that children get no benefit from this vaccine. Children are harmed by the vaccine. One in 2,700 boys will get myocarditis. Probably one in 1,100 girls will get a lifetime debilitating neurological injuries from the vaccine. Uh, the reactogen has, uh, this is according to Pfizer's own studies, the data from their studies. More shameless lies from RFK Jr. What a surprise. Every single study into COVID vaccinations and children shows a benefit. It's pretty undeniable. In fact, the youngest age groups that have received COVID mRNA vaccines display the best safety profile. We don't even see myocarditis in that age group. They're extremely safe for children. And the sooner in your life that you can develop a robust and broad immune memory to SARS coronaviruses, the better. Rubber stamping anything that comes from that panel. So if it goes to that panel, that panel is incapable of saying no. It will say yes, no matter, even if they brought something in there and said, this is going to kill all these kids, they would still stamp it. Go ahead. Here, Robert's talking about the committee that Kelly just brought up, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And surprise, it's a lie. ACIP does not just rubber stamp anything that comes across their committee. They have voted no or voted to reject several vaccines in the past. Flashing across your screen right now are just a few examples. Additionally, ACIP holds regular meetings that are open to the public, and in every single meeting, each member states their conflicts of interest and has to sign a boatload of paperwork explaining their conflicts of interest or lack thereof every single meeting. Maybe if Robert was honest and open-minded enough, he might attend some ACIP meetings and learn just that, but instead he lies about it. No, this is not going to help children. It is going to harm them grievously. Well, we know you're you're right. It, Drew and I talked about this on a previous show. Dr. Paul Offit, who is one of the people on the advisory committee, uh, who said he used the exact term terminology you did. He said he thought the fix was in when they were talking about uh, approving these vaccines under the EUA for use in children. And he essentially his services were essentially dismissed once it made he made it clear that he was not planning on uh, on voting for approval of these things. 
Of all the lies told on this episode, this is one of the most shameful. Paul Offit is definitely not on these people's side. Paul Offit is a staunch advocate of vaccines for children, including COVID vaccines. He has written several pieces on this topic and stated publicly several times that COVID vaccination in children is something that he recommends based on the science. What Paul Offit voted no on were boosters using bivalent COVID vaccines. These are COVID mRNA vaccines containing mRNA coding for the ancestral spike protein as well as the Omicron BA4, BA5 spike protein. The main reason he voted no was because he didn't see any evidence saying that those vaccines were any better than what we were already doing, which is really, really good. Yeah, Paul Offit voted no because he thought that the original ancestral vaccines were working really well and we didn't need a new bivalent booster. That is why he voted no not because of serious safety concerns about COVID vaccines in general, not because he is on any kind of anti-vaxxer side, but because he just didn't see the data for it. And that is reasonable. Kelly Victory, Dr. Drew, and Robert Kenny Jr. here are clueless. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just trying to lie to you any which way they can to convince you that they're right when they are just liars. If they, if they committed a a criminal act, which fraud is a criminal act, they can be prosecuted, but they would be prosecuted by the Department of Justice, federal agency. Oh yeah. Remember when Kelly Victory said this? Enjoy blanket immunity. Yeah. I told you she was wrong. Do this to protect other people, but it didn't, it doesn't protect other people. They just wanted to force us to do it. They knew from the beginning it didn't prevent transmission. They knew from May, 2020, I knew it. And I wrote an article about it. How did I know it? Because I looked at the monkey studies. Didn't Robert say earlier that they skipped animal studies? And now he's saying that he read monkey studies? Hmm. Real honest guy there, huh? Anyway, let's see what he thought he learned from the monkey study. I'm sure it's entirely correct. And when they gave the vaccine to monkeys, to macaques, and then they exposed them to wild virus, the vaccinated monkeys were had the same amount of viral concentrations in their nasal pharynx as the uh, unvaccinated monkeys. And right then I said, game over. So what he's talking about here is this study where researchers vaccinated macaques with COVID mRNA vaccines. Again, an animal study that he earlier denied existed. And then they challenged these macaques with SARS-CoV-2 virus. They then do a number of experiments on them, testing for efficacy and safety. And what Robert is referring to is this figure here, where they measure viral RNA copy numbers in the nasopharynx of the monkeys. And of course, they find a faster clearance of these viral RNA copy numbers in the nasopharynx of the vaccinated monkeys relative to the unvaccinated monkeys. What does that suggest? It suggested that vaccines are going to reduce the time period in which monkeys are shedding virus. However, this experiment does not test for infectious virus. I've explained this before in my video about COVID vaccines reducing transmission. So if you want more details on that, go check out that video. But the point here being that this particular animal experiment does not directly ask or answer the question of whether or not vaccines reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2. It just suggested that it does. And guess what? Further experiments showed that they do. If you care about science, my whole life has been science. That's what I do. Every, you know, I brought 500 legal cases. Every one of them involves scientific controversies. I read science for a living. They were never straight about the infection. That, that and the... the ex- the extraordinary measures to the, which they went to to crush anyone who raised their hand and said, um, just questioning, is this, is this okay here? Which was the part that really caught my attention early. This is a phenomenon of science deniers and anti-vaxxers called jacking or just asking questions. They're just jacking around or off or whatever. It's this thing that they do where they just ask a question, but they're not really interested in the answer. The only reason that they have for just asking questions is to sow doubt and plant seeds of confusion within their viewers' minds. Indeed, pretty much any question that they're asking, you can bet 
good money that scientists have already asked and answered that question. And the answer is one that doesn't agree with their preconceived beliefs that they're trying to spread to their audience that is giving them lots of money. So they ignore the answer and they just ask questions. And then they complain whenever scientists get fed up with them just asking questions in a totally honest way and dismiss them outright because it's clear that they're not honestly looking for answers. All of this helps them raise doubt against established science while at the same time looking like a victim. It's really pathetic. Our kids are swimming around in a toxic soup. And, you know, and there are many, many culprits to this. And it's, you know, ADD, it's, uh, it's you know, pesticides and glyphosate and neonicotinoid pesticides and PFOAs and Wi-Fi radiation, and all these assaults on their immune system that operate on the same pathways. I just played that clip so you could see the last thing he said there. Wi-Fi and radiation. Yeah, he's bordering on a 5G lunatic conspiracy theory there. Wacky. And if you think that Dr. Drew or Kelly Victory challenged that at all, of course not. They go right along with it. <laughs> and uh, Robert, I, I, we cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing your thoughts. Again, this is an environment where we're trying to hear all ideas. And Anyway, Kelly Victory and Dr. Drew give RFK Jr. a thankful send-off, and that's where it ends. Man, it is a god-awful episode of Dr. Drew, I'll tell you what. But apparently Dr. Drew has been going down this road of science denial for some time now. And this interview with RFK Jr. shows just how deep he's gotten. It's genuinely disappointing. And of course, I've been very critical of Dr. Drew here, but I'm always open to talking to whoever I make a video about. And that remains true to this day. Anyway, no anti-vaxxer grinds my gears and makes me face palm quite like RFK Jr. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. But that's gonna do it for this week's video. As always, all the links to all the science that I talk about are linked in the description below so that you can read them for yourself. And thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you really liked this video, then don't forget to check out my Patreon or maybe subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.